Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Michelle Putnam, and I would like to welcome you to today's CDC Partner Update call on COVID-19. This call serves as a way for CDC to share weekly updates on COVID-19 and our latest resources and guidance. Today's call will focus on CDC's efforts in getting the states ready to accept and administer a COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine confidence, and vaccine safety. First, we'll hear from our COVID-19 response acting chief medical officer who will describe where we are with the response. And then we'll we will hear from the director of the vaccine task force and two CDC subject matter experts who will share the latest information on COVID vaccine jurisdictional readiness, vaccine confidence, and vaccine safety. Afterwards, our speakers will stick around and answer a few questions we received over the last week via email. If you do experience any technical difficulties or otherwise would like to review today's call, you can find the recording on cdc.gov and YouTube within eight to 10 days. All past partner calls can be found there, so please take time to review and share prior recordings. If this is your first webinar with us, welcome. These calls occur every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Please see the link on the slide to subscribe and receive future call invitations. Please note this call is intended for CDC partners involved in the response and is not intended for media. Should media who are listening have questions, we invite you to reach out to media at cdc.gov. Also, we will have two short polls, one now that you see on your screen and another at the end of the presentations to get feedback about the effectiveness of these calls. Please answer the poll now for those of you who haven't already answered as we get started and then again before we start the question and answer section. Perfect. These calls are designed to share the latest science, guidance, and resources from CDC's website. There are over 2,000 documents providing information and guidance for individuals, businesses, and the public on cdc.gov. In addition to the resources we'll discuss today, please check out these recent web editions. CDC added vaccine-specific content to our COVID-19 website. CDC's new resources include information on vaccine planning, how vaccine safety is being ensured, and frequently asked questions. You'll hear more about these topics today, so save the link in the chat for later viewing. I'd also like to highlight CDC's COVID-19 science update page. This page shares peer-reviewed research findings for various COVID-19 related topics. An article in the last section of the November 3rd, 2020 edition is of interest to our vaccine topic today. In this article, in the publication Frontiers in Immunology, Vignesh and colleagues asked the question, is herd immunity against SARS-CoV-2 a silver lining? The authors discuss a variety of elements that factor into whether populations ever reach natural herd immunity thresholds. And spoiler alert, they conclude that the most practical way to achieve herd immunity is through vaccination. So there's always something interesting to learn on the science update page, and I recommend you check it out. And one more last minute addition before we continue, CDC just updated guidance for holiday gatherings, including Thanksgiving. So please find it at the link in the chat box. I am pleased to be joined today by three CDC experts on the COVID-19 response. Dr. Cliff McDonald is acting chief medical officer for the CDC COVID-19 emergency response. Dr. Nancy Messonnier is the director of CDC's vaccine task force. Dr. Amanda Cohn is the Chief Medical Officer, also for the Vaccine Task Force. And Dr. Tom Shimabukuro is the Team Lead for the Vaccine Safety Team, which is also a part of the CDC Vaccine Task Force. Now let's turn to Dr. McDonald for a really quick update. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome to everyone joining us today. My name is Dr. Cliff McDonald, and as mentioned, I am the Acting Chief Medical Officer for the Response. Today, I'd like to provide a brief update on the response and then hand it straight over to the Vaccine Task Force since they have a lot to cover today. Next slide. First, a situational update on cases and deaths. You can see from the slide that cases and deaths are increasing. One important statistic here is that the weekly average of cases over the past seven days is 24% greater uh, than the previous week's average. The weekly average of deaths also increased by 
These are significant weekly increases in case, cases and death counts. Since October 5th, when the average cases were 42,981 per day, average cases have increased 131% to 99,320 per day. What does this all mean? Well, when this percentage is decreasing, this tells us that mitigation efforts, including social distancing, hand hygiene, masking, cleaning, and increasing ventilation are working. When case counts increase as they have this week, this tells us that we need to step up mitigation efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19. One additional note, 86% of jurisdictions, which includes states, territories, and some cities, are in an increasing trajectory for cases. People everywhere can slow this spread by increasing mitigation in their own communities. We encourage you to visit CDC's data tracker for the latest stats and COVID view for a weekly summary of key indicators for the pandemic. With that, it is now my pleasure to hand you over to my colleagues, Dr. Nancy Massignier, Dr. Amanda Cohn, and Dr. Shima Bakuro. Great, this is Nancy Messonnier, and um, thanks for joining us today. It is actually a really exciting day in our search for safe and effective COVID vaccines. Pfizer Pharmaceuticals announced this morning results from their clinical trial, which they report showed a 90% effectiveness at that phase three trial. They also report that they expect to hit their safety time points by the third week in November, which means we are on track to have the first available COVID vaccines by early December. We at CDC, along with I'm sure many of you, look forward to further details and further information um, about that vaccine. You know, as you all know, it's incredibly important to have safe and effective vaccines, but of course, it's not just enough to have the safe and effective vaccines. We also need safe and effective ways to implement those vaccines. The public health impact of vaccines relies on rapid, efficient, and high uptake of a complete series with the particular focus on those at increased risk for severe disease. And this graphic just shows the multiple components to vaccine implementation. We're working simultaneously on all of these areas as we wait for an approved, authorized, and recommended COVID vaccine. Today's talk will focus on two key areas of public interest and concern vaccine safety measures, and monitoring and communications, specifically how we ensure that individuals feel empowered to vaccinate with confidence and receive the vaccine with confidence. Before Dr. Cohen and Dr. Shima Bokor delve into those topics, I would like to provide a very brief update on state, territorial, and tribal readiness. Next slide. Over the past um, multitude of months, we've been working on providing technical assistance to jurisdictions, by which I mean states, territories, and tribal nations, as well as federal entities to be ready for the initial COVID vaccine. And one of the things that we're working on, as shown in the right, is helping each of the jurisdictions develop their own playbook based on this federal guidance. But like everything, federal guidance actually has to be um, tailored to a specific location. And so we're taking these federal interim playbook um, modules and adapting it to each location. But there are a few things that we're really pressing now that we need every jurisdiction to complete really quickly. And this um, gives me an opportunity to just mention those four things, which are really important steps towards readiness. We need each of the jurisdictions to sign a data use agreement that allows us to ensure tracking of uptake, identify pockets of low vaccination, identify and intervene in places where there are coverage disparities and allocate vaccine products. All of our jurisdictions are working now to identify and enroll vaccination provider sites. And this is key, especially for the early sites that we need ready to administer the initial vaccines to groups at higher risk, specifically healthcare workers, essential workers, and long-term care facilities. We really need all of the jurisdictions to continue to progress towards micro planning. And in this case, the level of planning that we're asking for is much more detailed than what we've done in any other response. 
because it's complicated. There are various products and there are various allocation scenarios, but we need to ensure readiness across all these different scenarios. We don't want there to be any time space between when a vaccine is available and when we're ready to implement it, to get it to people who will benefit from it. And finally, we're asking all of our jurisdictions to start working to begin preparing for accessing under-resourced communities and disproportionately affected groups. These groups are incredibly important and we need to start working now so that we really have all our plans in place before the vaccines are available. There is a link for this information on the slide and we'll add it to the chat. Now I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Cohen to explain more about communication efforts around COVID vaccines. Amanda? Good afternoon and thank you, Dr. Messonnier. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with all of you today. What is getting in the way of vaccine confidence in the US? Next slide. We've all seen the reports showing the considerable decline in COVID-19 vaccine acceptability in the US public. Concerns about side effects, whether or not the vaccine will work, perceptions of risk, and concerns about cost and access contribute to this decline. But those who indicate now that they will not get vaccinated may shift as they understand the vaccine process and data over the coming months. Next slide. We know attributes that can help increase acceptance. For example, if your healthcare provider says it is safe or if there are no costs to the individual, if it will help get people back to work or school, and if people can get it easily from a walk-in or drive-through clinic, pharmacy, or at their provider's office. Next slide. Most of the US population lies somewhere along the middle of the vaccine demand continuum and may be less confident, motivated, or may not e easily be able to access vaccine. So increasing vaccine demand requires not just increasing vaccine confidence, but also reducing barriers to vaccine. The many different, uh, all of the implementation work that is happening at the jurisdictional level will help reduce barriers to access by bringing vaccine closer to individuals and communities rather than asking people to come to the vaccine. I, I cannot leave this slide without uh, uh, showing you all that this slide reminds me very much of voter turnout. Many people want to vote, will consider voting or are so so about voting, but making voting easier will increase turnout. And, and we're really approaching vaccination in the same way. For the next part of this, this discussion, I'll focus on the second component of generating vaccine demand, which is building confidence. Next slide. Next slide. Individuals across the continuum will have concerns. These concerns are understandable and need to be addressed with empathy and transparency. I have questions I want answered before getting vaccinated, but I'm fortunate to understand the process and I'm confident my questions will be answered carefully by multiple groups before a vaccine is authorized and recommended. Concerns about healthcare among healthcare providers is a risk for overall vaccine confidence and is a very new kind of risk where we have to face with COVID vaccination. Healthcare providers are the most trusted source for health information. And even during early phases of vaccination, when an individual may receive vaccine in their workplace or a public health vaccination clinic, they will look to their own healthcare providers or family members in the healthcare field for support in their decision to get the vaccine. And finally, communities have unique experiences in forming COVID-19 vaccine perceptions and communities' positive or negative impressions of public health and their experience with the pandemic over the last several months will inform their starting place on COVID vaccines. Engagement with community organizations and leaders will expand access to clear and accurate information on COVID vaccines. Next slide. So I want to introduce um, our Vaccinate with Confidence strategy, which is a national strategy to reinforce confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. Um, can you please go three slides? Thank you. Um, so there are three pillars 
to this vaccinate with confidence strategy. The first is to reinforce trust. We want to regularly share clear and accurate information about COVID-19 vaccines and take visible actions to build that trust in vaccines, the vaccinator, and the system. Next slide. Um, so the different things we can do to communicate to, to build trust is to communicate transparently um, by making a recommendations for and monitoring the safety of and distributing COVID-19 vaccines. We need to provide regular updates on the benefits, safety, and effectiveness, including updates from an independent vaccine safety monitoring system. And we need to proactively address and mitigate the spread of harm and misinformation. We have to be forthcoming in what information we know and what we don't know. We can't overpromise on the availability or the impact of these vaccines. While I hope they are, COVID vaccines are not unlikely to be a complete panacea, and vaccines will be an important part of our efforts to end and recover from this pandemic, but we still have, to have will have a lot to learn about their potential impact. Even with the exciting news of today, we will be learning more and more about these vaccines over the next year. Being frank, clear, and transparent is important not just to the science and healthcare community, but to everyone. Next slide. There are several sample products and tools that we are working on that will be um, available on the CDC website and for our partners to use, such as the journey of a COVID-19 vaccine infographic, intergraphic vaccine, interactive vaccine rollout timeline and webpage, and a field guide to address and build resilience against vaccine information. Next slide. The second pillar of this strategy is to promote confidence among healthcare personnel in their decision to get vaccinated and to recommend vaccination to their parents. Next slide. I want to be clear that healthcare personnel means much more than those working in doctor's offices and hospitals. Millions of Americans don't have a primary care doctor, but they rely on the consult and advice of their community pharmacists. Families of older adults living in long-term care facilities will speak to the staff working in the facility when consenting their loved ones to be vaccinated. These conversations with patients, regardless of the type of healthcare provider, need to start early and often. So ensuring healthcare personnel have the tools they need to have empathetic and tailored conversations is critical. Some of the tactics we'll be using for the strategy are to engage health systems and healthcare personnel early and often. Ensuring healthcare systems and medical practices create a culture that is supportive of COVID-19 vaccine, um, which includes ensuring that they have um, knowledge and awareness about how to administer COVID vaccines safely, um, and supporting empathetic conversations in healthcare encounters to confidently address vaccine-related questions and provide tailored vaccine information to patients. Next slide. Some sample products uh, related to this strategy that will soon be available on the CDC web pages and sent to partners include a talking to patients about COVID-19 vaccine slide deck for healthcare providers and a tips and time savers fact sheet for healthcare providers to talk to patients. Next slide. The third pillar of this strategy is to engage communities in sustainable, equitable, and inclusive ways to increase collaboration and build trust. A common theme from focus groups around vaccine confidence is, I don't want someone to tell me what to do. I want to be listened to and for information to be discussed with me. We need to empower trusted messengers, local community organizations, faith-based partners, particularly in communities of color, with information they need to have open and inclusive discussions about vaccination in their community. Thanks, <laughs> next slide. These are some of the tactics um, that I just described. And some of the sample products and tools include a vaccinate with confidence for COVID uh, community assessment guide and toolkit and vaccinate with confidence with COVID vaccines, 19 vaccines slide deck in multiple formats and languages. So we are, once we build our messaging, which is ongoing at this time, we are going to adapt our messaging in multiple different ways for partners who will then continue to use and adapt those materials even more to tailor for their communities. Um, one of the um, 
uh, exciting things I heard in the last couple of weeks is um, when we asked the jurisdictions which languages they wanted our communications materials to be translated into, over 22 languages were sent to us. This demonstrates how thoughtful and inclusive jurisdictions are being in their planning for vaccine implementation, but also illustrates the scope and diversity of the communities that we need to engage. Next slide. Vaccinate with Confidence is not an advertising, marketing, or communications campaign. Um, we will not be having billboards that say Vaccinate with Confidence. Um, rather, it is a cohesive framework to support health departments, healthcare providers, immunization provi partners, and community partners and leaders to promote COVID-19 vaccine. We're, we're using evidence-based content to amplify messages that enable an individual to make the decision to get vaccinated. And this strategy is really critical to the success of the COVID-19 vaccination program to ensure safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines can help control and reduce the impact of this pandemic. I believe this, uh, next slide. I'm going to pass this uh, presentation along to uh, Tom Shmupakora, who will uh, talk about one of the most important aspects of instilling vaccinate, confi vaccinate with confidence, which is to ensure that we uh, have a robust uh, vaccine safety monitoring system uh, and that the public understands this system. I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Thanks, Amanda. Can, can folks hear me? I just want to confirm you can hear me okay before I start. Yes, we can hear you. All right, great. Um, hi, I'm Tom Shimobakuro, and I'm with the Immunization Safety Office at CDC. And um, before I get into uh, some of the details here, I just want to list some top the top three takeaways that I want to um, have you take away from my presentation. And that's number one: the U.S. vaccine safety system is strong and robust. And I will walk you through some of the ways that we monitor vaccine safety. Number two, new safety systems are being added for COVID-19 vaccines. And number three, you can play an important role in helping CDC monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. And I'm not just talking to the healthcare providers or the scientists on this call. I'm talking to anyone who is going to get vaccinated. You can participate in the process and you can help CDC monitor vaccine safety. And I'll show you how you can do that. Next slide. So vaccines are one of the greatest success stories in public health. And you can see them here at the, at the top of the list of, top, of 10 great public health achievements. Um, through vaccines, we have eradicated smallpox globally. We're, we're, we're near to eliminating pol wild polio virus. And we've dramatically reduced the amount of illness and amount of death from infectious diseases like measles and diphtheria and, and, and whooping cough. But to ensure the continued success of vaccines, it's crucial to make sure that vaccines are safe. Next slide. So this is a figure that I've taken off the CDC's website. And um, it looks a little complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through this and the various steps that go through authorizing or approving a vaccine. So you see on the left-hand side there, this is really the early stages of vaccine development. And um, vaccine safety is a priority during all phases of development, authorization, approval, and use. So initially there are things like basic research, discovery and preclinical studies, and these are studies um, in, in, in animals, um, non-humans. Um, if those are successful, then we move on to the phased clinical trials. And these phased clinical trials look at safety and effectiveness and the, 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 the dosing of the vaccines and how many doses might be required. And if these are successful, then uh, a, a BLA, biologics license application, or in the case of COVID uh, vaccines, an emergency use authorization um, will be submitted the FDA does a thorough review and recommends authorization of or approval for that vaccine. Shortly thereafter, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices does a review and issues a recommendation. Now that vaccine's ready for use 
um, to, to go out there and be administered in the population. And then we move into something called phase four or post authorization or post approval monitoring. And that's intense monitoring of vaccine safety once the vaccines have been authorized or approved for use and are out there in the community being administered. Um, the CDC and FDA collaborate on safety monitoring. We also have other partners that we work with such as the VA, the Department of Defense, the Indian Health Service and other government agencies um, that, uh, that administer healthcare programs and do scientific research. Next slide. So you might ask, why do we do this post authorization or post licensure safety monitoring? The vaccines have already been determined to be safe and effective after the FDA authorizes or licenses a vaccine. Well, the reasons for that are the safety standards for vaccines are high. Um, vaccines are for prevention of disease. Unlike medicines, um, which are given to treat disease, um, for vaccines, the individuals aren't actually ill with the disease the vaccines are intended to present, uh, prevent. So the, the safety standards um, for, for vaccines are, 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 are quite high and higher than they are for, for, for medicines. Also, the clinical trials, which I explained on the previous slide, used to authorize the, the vaccines um, may not detect all types of adverse events, especially ones that are rare or take longer to occur, um, which we call a delayed onset. So the, the clinical trials for COVID vaccines are, are quite large. They're in the range of 30,000 or more individuals. And like I said, those are, those are large clinical trials and they're large enough to um, characterize the, the basic safety of the vaccine and to detect and characterize common side effects um, however, if you do have, if, if, you, if you have 30,000 individuals in your, your clinical trial, but you have a, an, an adverse event that's very rare, say on the order of one per 100,000 individuals vaccinated, we may not capture that in the clinical trial. And that's why we do this intensive monitoring after the vaccines are authorized and out there being, being used. Also, the clinical trials don't always look at special populations, but, and by that I mean pregnant women or people with certain pre-existing medical conditions. Um, they're generally focused on, on, on healthy adults, um, and certainly when these vaccines are out there in use, and especially for COVID vaccines, we're interested in protecting people with certain pre-existing medical conditions, so we want to make sure that we understand the safety in these special populations. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about some of CDC's vaccine safety systems. I'll also mention a little later some of our, our, um, our, our federal agency partners that, that do monitoring and, and, and touch on their systems. But um, in the CDC's Immunization Safety Office, we have three core programs, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, the Vaccine Safety Data Link, and the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. Next slide. I'm gonna start with a vaccine adverse event reporting system, which I'll refer to as VAERS. So VAERS is the nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It is co-managed by CDC and FDA, and it's, it's called what, what, what we refer to as a spontaneous reporting or a passive surveillance system. And what that means is we depend on people out there, healthcare providers, parents, patients who get vaccinated, caregivers and others to send reports of their experience after vaccination to CDC. Um, we also get reports from manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers, and those are usually reports that healthcare providers send to manufacturers and then manufacturers then route into theirs. So um, we, we basically, we don't go out for, for VAERS, we don't go out and find these reports. We depend on individuals to send them to us to build this database of side effects or suspected side effects. We call them adverse events um, after immunization. Next slide. So VAERS covers the entire US population. That's roughly 320 million residents. Um, so anyone who's eligible to receive a vaccine, anyone who's eligible to get a COVID vaccine, basically this is the covered population for our vaccine safety surveillance in VAERS. That includes all ages, all races, 
all states and jurisdictions, both healthy people and those with chronic health problems. Anyone who's eligible to get a vaccine and gets a vaccine basically is, is a covered individual for the purpose of safety monitoring and VAERS. And we get about 40 to 50,000 in recent years, 40 to 50,000 total US reports, and that's about 1,000 reports per week. Next slide. So VAERS accepts all reports from anyone, regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. And I'm gonna take a little time to explain this statement. So the, the basic timeline for a report to VAERS is that an individual gets a vaccination. At some point after that vaccination, the individual experiences an adverse health event. And then that adverse health event is subsequently reported to VAERS. Now that adverse health event could be related to the vaccine or it could be um, co completely coincidental and not related to the vaccine at all. But we accept all these reports, regardless of whether we think the vaccine may have caused it or not. Um, to us, these are adverse events, adverse health events that occurred after vaccination, and we want to know about them and we accept them. Um, likewise, we don't, really don't judge the clinical seriousness of the event. We will accept any report that's submitted to us, whether there is a significant health impact or it's something just routine that we would expect after a vaccination. The strengths of VAERS are that it can rapidly detect potential safety problems and it can detect rare adverse events. And remember when I said that um, if, you, if you're not vaccinating that many people and you have a rare adverse event, it, you may not be able to catch it in that population. However, as I explained on a previous slide, when you have all 320 million U.S. residents as your potential population, we do have the ability to detect these very rare, rare adverse events, and we have the ability to rapidly detect potential safety problems. A key limitation is inconsistent quality and completeness of information. So we, we only have information on a subset of individuals who experience an adverse health event after an immunization and then decide to report it in or their healthcare provider decides to report it in or the parent of a child decides to report it in. These reports can vary from being very complete and very informative to, um, and, and those are often from healthcare providers, to um, information which is, is, is not that complete um, and difficult to interpret. Um, we also don't have any information on an unvaccinated control group and we don't have inf we sometimes don't have information on how many people got vaccinated because of that in vares probably the the main limitation is we cannot determine cause and effect from vares data alone vares is basically a signal detection system and when we detect signals and we think there may be a potential problem we go to other more robust and stronger data systems to further evaluate those quote unquote signals next slide so this is information on how to report an adverse event to VAERS. And again, anyone can report an adverse event to VAERS. You don't have to be a healthcare provider. You don't have to be a scientist. You can be just an individual who got vaccinated. You can be a parent. You can be a concerned caregiver. You simply go to the website and this is the landing page for VAERS. And you'll see right up there in the top left-hand corner, there's a link that says report an adverse event. And that will take you to the um, subsequent pages that will allow you to electronically file a report. You can also call the 1-800 number you see there. You can email the information email. And if you want to, uh, if you're more of a visual learner, you can go out to this YouTube uh, video and you can see CDC and FDA scientists explain the VAERS program and how to submit a VAERS report. Next slide. So now I wanna move into another of our CDC systems called the Vaccine Safety Data Link. And this is a collaboration between CDC and nine participating integrated healthcare organizations. Um, that is probably just a fancy word for nine large insurers. And you can see these sites here. Um, many of them are these Kaiser Permanente health plans out on the West Coast, but we do have um, decent geographic representation. 
uh, in the system, we have data on over 12 million persons per year. So unlike VAERS where um, an individual patient or a parent uh, or a healthcare provider is, is a participant in the system and is sending in information, in the vaccine safety data link, these are, are basically large databases of healthcare utilization data. And so the neither the patients nor the nor the um, healthcare providers are, are, are probably aware of in the same sense as in VAERS that they're actually involved in this safety monitoring process. Next slide. So the types of information we have in VSD are the typical information we have from electronic health record data and administrative data that are generated by health insurers in the process of administering healthcare programs and of submitting um, claims. And this includes information on immunization, so immunization records, outpatient visits, emergency room visits, hospitalizations and discharges, procedure codes, birth and death certificate information, and demographics. And all this information are linked by study IDs. Uh, in addition, if we do need to go in and look at a particular case, say we need to go in and confirm the diagnosis or we need more in information on an individual case, we can go in and we can look at charts and electronic health records. All these processes and procedures um, are subject to privacy protections, federal privacy protections, and protections under HIPAA law. Next slide. So one of the main types of analyses we do in the vaccine safety data link is called near real-time sequential monitoring. We call it rapid cycle analysis. And by near real-time, I mean weekly. So scientists, which includes physicians, epidemiologists, other health scientists, choose a limited number of adverse events to monitor. And on a weekly basis, as healthcare information is being um, is populating the vaccine safety data link database, they do weekly analyses to do safe monitoring. And if these scientists find a statistical link between a vaccination and an adverse event, they investigate it further, determine if a true safety problem exists. And that may be, like I said on the previous slide, going in and looking at the chart to make sure that the diagnosis is correct, to make sure that um, the, diag the symptoms didn't start actually before vaccination and determine that the patient actually got vaccinated. So these are some of the checks that scientists do. Um, if they need to do further checks, they can actually go in and do a formal scientific study. Next slide. So some other data systems from our federal partners include F FDA's collaboration with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and monitoring in the CMS database. The CMS database is a very large and powerful system for monitoring vaccine safety in older adults. This includes uh, nearly all of the adults in the United States age 65 and older. And it also includes about 650 nursing home residents. Again, a special population, like I mentioned previously, that we wanna make sure we are able to monitor safety in these individuals when we start administering COVID-19 vaccines. They also have another um, system called BEST, which uses um, data from large insurers. And our colleagues at the, at the Departments of Veterans Affairs, um, they run their own healthcare system. They have their own electronic healthcare record. They do similar types of this real-time sequential monitoring um, that I described that we do in the vaccine safety data link. Next slide. So I'm gonna briefly touch on our clinical immunization safety assessment project, which is a collaboration between CDC and seven participating medical research centers and you see them here on the map. Um, our CISA program uh, does clinical consult services and also does clinical research. Next slide. So our, our consult service in the clinical immunization safety assessment projects assists US healthcare providers with complex vaccine safety questions about their patients. So if a healthcare provider does have a a question or a concern or needs um, advice on how to proceed with vaccinating a patient, um, they can go to CDC info, you see the website there and they can request a consult and, and CDC and its 
its uh, investigators at CISA will do a detailed review of the case and, 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 offer, uh, and offer advice on how to proceed with that patient. Next slide. Um, I wanna move on to a new system that we've stood up just for COVID-19 and it's called vSafe. It's active safety monitoring for COVID-19 vaccines. By active, it means we are actively contacting them, reaching out to them and asking them for information um, during the vaccination process. So it's a new smartphone-based monitoring program that uses text messaging and web surveys to check in with vaccine recipients after vaccination. So when a person um, is vaccinated, we ask them to register and I will cover the registration process in just a second. Once the person is, is registered, we start shooting them text messages with web links. Um, it's daily for the first week and then it's weekly up to six weeks and then check-ins at three, six and 12 months. And we ask them some questions about how they're doing. We do uh, what is essentially a health impact assessment and if there are any health impacts that we think need following up, um, then, then we, can, we can follow up uh, and, and actively contact that individual. So patients can report side effects or healthcare problems, and we'll do active telephone follow-up by CDC um, for reports with significant health impact. Next slide. So this is a pretty high level schematic of what I just described. So you see up on the top left-hand corner, that is the CDC. And you see in the right, that is the vaccine recipient. You see this bi-directional communication. After successful registration, we begin to send them text messages with web links asking how they are. These are, these are daily check-ins during the first week, then weekly through six weeks, then three, six, and 12 months. These vaccine recipients send information back to CDC. Um, we, we defined a clinically important event that may have health impact. Um, that's if an individual on any one of these check-ins reported that they missed work, they were unable to do normal daily activities, or they received medical care. If any one of those boxes is checked on, on the, the web survey, that information is made known to our call center. Um, with the vaccine adverse event reporting system. And we will reach out to that individual and do a telephone follow-up and take a, take a VAERS report if appropriate. And that information eventually gets communicated to CDC and FDA. Next slide. So, and I apologize about this, uh, this blurred, uh, this blurred information sheet, but we, we had to do that because it's in progress and it contains a, a scannable QR code and we didn't want people scanning the, uh, the test QR code. But um, what will happen is CDC will create an electronic version of the vSafe enrollment sheet for printing. And the enrollment sheet is, uh, a, a, a shot of the enrollment sheet is here on the right. Um, we will ask that healthcare providers give the one page enrollment sheet to patients at the time of vaccination and counsel patients on the important of, importance of enrolling in vSafe. Um, we, we hope that this will convince um, the vaccinated individual that, that we are concerned with their health and we wanna check up on them and also let them know that this is a way that they can participate in safety monitoring and help make vaccines safe for everybody. Next slide. So moving on to your role, um, COVID-19 safety gets stronger with your participation. And as I have said, you don't have to be a healthcare provider. You don't have to be a research scientist to participate in vaccine safety. Um, we, we, we want your assistance. We want your partnership. We want you to be part of the process. And for the general public, um, you can choose to participate in vSafe and you can encourage others that you know, friends, family, coworkers to participate in vSafe, our new text monitoring, uh, safety monitoring program just for COVID-19. You can also report an adverse event to VAERS. Um, if, you, if you do feel like you've had an adverse health event, you're, you certainly should follow up with your healthcare provider if you feel you need medical care, your healthcare provider can submit a report to VAERS, but you can also submit a report to VAERS too. Anyone can submit a report to VAERS. And for healthcare providers, we encourage, um, we, we ask that you encourage patients to participate in vSafe. 
and to continue to report clinically important adverse events to VAERS. Next slide. So just to recap what I've said, I wanna move back to the original three takeaways. The US vaccine safety system is strong and robust. Vaccine safety is a priority for us. We have established systems that we use um, to continuously monitor the vaccine, continuously monitor vaccine safety. We monitor hundreds of millions of doses administered every year. That includes over 100 million doses of flu vaccine administered each flu vaccine. This is a regular activity for us. Our system is strong and it's robust. Um, new safety systems are being added for COVID-19. I mentioned the vSafe text monitoring system. And finally, you can play an important role in helping CDC monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. We want your participation in vSafe. And if you think you've had a potential side effect after a vaccine, we want you to report that information to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Next slide. So on behalf of my co-presenters, I'm just gonna wrap things up. Um, what you need to know, we are in a complicated vaccine landscape with many types of vaccines in development that could possibly be authorized by FDA. CDC and FDA will deploy their routine procedures and systems to ensure vaccines are safe and effective. Vaccination populations will evolve over time. Limited vaccine doses may be available in 2020, but supply will increase over time. Initially, vaccines will only be authorized and recommended for adults. COVID-19 vaccine planning is changing rapidly and new information will be available soon. As a trusted source of information, you will play a critical role in helping build confidence in COVID-19 vaccination. And finally, getting your flu shot this year will be more important than ever. Next slide. And if you wish to uh, uh, get more information, you can go to the CDC coronavirus website at the link above. Next slide. And I'll turn it back over to the moderator for Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Shima Bukur. I appreciate it. And thank you to Dr. McDonald and Dr. Messigny and Dr. Cohn as well for sharing those updates. And we will move on to question and answers. But before we get started answering your questions, please take a moment and answer a couple of our questions by taking the poll on your screen. And we very much appreciate your participation in the poll. So we've received over 40 questions in advance, and we'll get to as many of those as we can in, um, in the next 10 minutes or so. That was a really robust call with a lot of robust information. But first, I'll move it over to you, Dr. McDonald. We, we do have some questions that came in on flu vaccine trends and illness trends. So could you give a short update on what we're seeing around flu vaccine trends as well as illness trends? And are there any flu communications resources available from CDC? Yes, certainly happy to address this. Uh, the national influenza activity is currently low. During the 2020-2021 cold and flu season, getting a flu vaccine is more important than ever to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community from flu. Flu vaccination can flatten the curve of flu illnesses and also help protect essential workers from flu and save medical resources for care of patients with COVID-19. The more people who are vaccinated against flu, the more people will be protected from flu. It's not too late to get vaccinated. Flu vac activity is still low, and CDC recommends vaccination continue throughout the fall and winter. Uh, manufacturers have projected that as many as 194 to 198 million doses of flu vaccine will be available in the United States this season. As of October 30th, more than 172 million doses of flu vaccine have been distributed. Flu vaccine is widely available at locations across the US, although robust demand in some places may mean some providers are awaiting additional shipments of vaccine and supplies required to support flu vaccination efforts like needles or syringes. Flu vaccine manufacturing has been extended to, su to support production of a record number of doses and flu vaccine will be distributed incrementally as it is produced check out the flu resources available on the CDC website shown in the uh, 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 chat box now. Thanks. 
Wonderful, thank you, Dr. McDonald. And Dr. Cohn, I'll turn to you in a moment. We have a few questions about the process for determining vaccination priority. Um, so Dr. Cohn, can you tell us, uh, when is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or ACIP scheduled to vote on recommendations for the COVID vaccine? And can you tell us a little bit about that process? Sure. So the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has met several times and had public meetings, which you can go to the website and find information about. Uh, they have discussed both the vaccines that are moving forward as well as issues around prioritization. Additionally, there's a COVID-19 vaccines work group that is meeting on a weekly basis. ACIP will vote on recommendations for COVID-19 vaccines after a vaccine product is authorized by the FDA. We anticipate having a meeting, having a meeting scheduled for ACIP to consider and vote on recommendations uh, within two to three days of an EUA uh, authorization. Um, we can't, uh, we, we anticipate that timeline as um, long as there are uh, no curveballs uh, thrown our way uh, during that process. Uh, it's really important for everyone to know that we are using all of the same processes and procedures for considerations around uh, both authorizing these vaccines, which is the role of FDA and VRPAC, as well as recommending these vaccines and for re recommending priority groups for these, rec for these vaccines, which is uh, ACIP. Uh, so we want to ensure that we have a public and transparent process. And you can always uh, go to www.cdc.gov forward slash vaccines forward slash ACIP for information on both previous meetings as well as upcoming meetings when that's announced. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Cohn. That's a great resource for folks to check out. Um, we do have a couple of questions on, you kind of mentioned those priority groups when it comes to vaccines. So we understand the first priority when the vaccine initially becomes available will be healthcare community. And then later as we get increased supply and more venues to be vaccinated. Can you talk a little bit about how essential workers will be vac vaccinated? For example, will they go to a local pharmacy? And kind of in addition of special populations, let's say that we have an adult with cystic fibrosis Will they be permitted to receive the vaccine early or will they need to wait? And same with, you know, seniors with autoimmune diseases or cancer history. Thanks. There are uh, multiple different parts to that question. Yes. Uh, I will try to answer in order. Um, so uh, healthcare providers are anticipated to be one of the uh, first groups recommended uh, to be prioritized for vaccination. Um, that is, uh, that has been indicated by several groups, including ACIP in their public discussions. Uh, we then anticipate that recommended groups will expand to essential workforce, uh, which includes first responders, uh, persons critical for national security, as well as teachers, grocery store workers, um, persons in transportation. Um, this is a large number of people. The number of people that includes is up to 87 million. Um, we anticipate that this is going to be a stepwise process uh, where as we understand more about the number of doses that are available, the different products, and uh, the way that um, those products will be uh, delivered, that will sort of allow um, the, the groups uh, and the timing of when different groups will be vaccinated may shift um, at a at a jurisdictional level, um, but also uh, but but will be sort of nationally driven, but locally decided. If if that makes sense, um, we uh, we anticipate that shortly, uh, as over time, there will be multiple places where an individual can go get vaccinated during these early phases. Uh, we do. We believe that there will be fewer vaccination sites available, especially because this Pfizer vaccine requires ultra cold uh, storage and handling. Uh, so we anticipate vaccine being available primarily through health clinics and hospitals. Uh, then we need to. Uh, then we anticipate shifting to uh, 
pharmacies uh, and uh, doctor's offices to uh, get people vaccinated. But the jurisdictions are developing very strong implementation plans to make sure that they reach all populations, um, including those at risk because of a medical condition um, and persons who are living in socially vulnerable communities. Um, and uh, it will be a big lift over the next six to nine months. But we do anticipate that everyone will have the ability to get a vaccine uh, over the course of next year. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn. And Dr. Messinier, I'll shift over to you for a little bit and shift gears just a, a little bit. I know we have four minutes, but we're going to cram in as much as we can because these are um, great presentations and great discussion here um, with you all. Will the COVID-19 immunization be a requirement or would it be an option like the flu shot? And similarly, kind of for students, is it a requirement for students go, to go to school? Um, what say you on that, Dr. Messinier? Yeah, so this is a great question for people to understand. The federal government actually doesn't make requirements for vaccinations. It's actually state requirements, for example, that kids need to have vaccines to go to school. And frankly, those vaccine requirements have been very effective in increasing coverage of certain vaccines where vaccinating would put other children, I'm sorry, we're under vaccinating would put other children at risk. But that being said, again, it's the states that would be making those requirements not CDC and not the federal government. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier, for that. And kind of pivoting off a little from there, are there still two doses that people are going to be required to take? And do we know how far apart and if this will come out of pocket or if it's going to be covered under insurance? So also trying to be brief so we can cram in a lot of questions, I'm going to give the short answer. There are multiple vaccines under development in the United States, but the vaccines that we expect to be authorized first both require two shots and they're not interchangeable. You need the same second shot that you got the first shot. One of those vaccines timeline is zero days and 21 days and the other vaccine is zero days and 28 days. In terms of cost, the government purchased these vaccines and therefore they won't be, there won't be any cost to the patient. There are um, differences in terms of how providers will be paid for administering the vaccine. And that really depends on the type of insurance that the patient has, but there should be no out of pocket cost for anyone getting vaccinated. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, just two more questions, if I can really squeeze them in here. We know that there's information that says the flu vaccine wanes over time. Do we have any indication yet about how long a COVID immunization would last? We, we don't, and that's why it's very important, in addition to the um, presentation that you heard from Dr. Shima Bakora, we also have systems put in place to look at the effectiveness of the vaccine once it's rolled out, and we'll be managing closely to look at the duration of protection. The duration of protection once the vaccine is being used broadly across the population will be our best way to understand how long it's working, and whether or not there needs to be revaccination, for example, a year from now. Thank you. Thank you. And last question to wrap up the call for you, Dr. Messonnier. When can we stop countermeasures like social distancing and mask wearing? I think what I'm trying to ask is, what will the end game look like, and will we always be wearing masks? Yeah, I, I, actually, thanks for asking that question. I think it's really important for everybody to understand that while there's good news about the Pfizer announcement this morning, we actually don't know how long these vaccines will last or what they will do once they're actually broadly used in the population. So to level set, in the beginning, we expect vaccines will be available at limited supplies, as you heard from Dr. Cohn, for some specific groups of people. We do expect over time for there to be more vaccine available, but we really need everybody to keep wearing their masks and to keep up the social distancing because all of these measures together, a vaccine plus a mask plus the social distancing, those are the tools that we're going to use as a whole as a whole to get this pandemic under control. So please don't stop wearing your mask. We all need to keep going for now. And we'll certainly look forward to um, a, a time when we're not required to keep up those precautions, but that day is certainly not now. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Messonnier. Those are great words to end on, I, I'll say. And I want to thank all of our presenters, Dr. Messonnier, Dr. Cohn, Dr. Shima Bakura. Thank you so much for being here today. It was really robust presentations, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. It's so much to include in just an hour. But I also want to say thank you to everyone for joining our call. A recording will be posted online on CDC's COVID-19 webpage and on YouTube in a few days. So you can check there. The subscription link to receive future updates and invitations is listed on the slide. And thank you again. And please join us next time. I'll do a quick plug here. Monday, November 16th, our topic will be healthy workplaces, tips and tools for operating your business. So definitely send us questions. And until next time, thank you all and be well.